I'm not in your in your um, picture, but I'll be right back. It's great to see new faces, returning faces. All right, folks, I'm gonna go ahead and take a picture on three. So go ahead, um, one, two, three, cheese. <laughs> Perfect. I'm gonna take another one for us. So this time say safe drinking water. One, two, three, safe drinking water. <laughs> Excellent, awesome. Thanks so much, folks. So we're gonna go ahead and get started in about two minutes. All right, for advisory group members, one final reminder, um, if you could please select your language at the bottom of the screen, interpretation icon, it's a globe. Click the globe, select your language, either English or Spanish. And then at the top of your screen, you're also able to select which PowerPoint slide you are um, viewing. So if you click the top, you'll, you'll be able to um, either select English or Spanish PowerPoint to view. And then I see that we've been joined by Don. Don, if you just wanna come on video and audio, just to um, say hello and make sure your audio is working. Can you hear me? We can hear you, welcome. Oh, good, thank you. So I'm good now, I can sign off for a minute? Yeah, we're about okay. to get started. Okay. Awesome. And then David Corey's here, I finally got on, on my audio working. Awesome, glad your audio is working. And then David, do you also have a, a camera today? I don't today. Okay, well, glad you can join us. Awesome, so we'll go ahead and take a group picture at the end so that um, folks who weren't able to join us in the beginning will be in the group picture at the end. All right, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So we're, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our meeting today. So I wanna welcome everyone. My name is Adriana Renteria. I'm the director for the Office of Public Participation. And I wanna thank everyone for taking the time to join us during today's um, first Safe and Affordable Fund for Equity and Resilience Advisory Group meeting of 2021. Um, before we get started, I just wanna say that this meeting is being publicly webcast in both English and Spanish at video.calipa.ca.gov. And we're also recording today's meeting. So those um, who were unable to join us will be able to uh, review the recording online. We have note takers capturing the main points of today's conversation, and we'll be sure to send out those notes to advisory group members within three weeks. I wanna move us to the slide of the mission statement for the water boards. 
And I just want to ground us before we begin our meeting uh, with our mission statement. So the Water Board's mission is to preserve, enhance, and restore California's water resources for the benefit of present and future generations. That's why we want to begin this meeting by acknowledging the groups who have and continue to experience economic, environmental, and social disadvantages as a result of historic marginalization and whose daily lives are impacted by racism and injustice. So as we begin our meeting today, um, we want to remind everyone that our work should strengthen the empowerment of Indigenous and community voices as we all work together to provide clean, safe, and affordable water to all Californians. So for our meeting, there's a few guidelines we'd like to quickly review. Number one, to please mute yourself when you're not speaking. For advisory group members, if you are able to join by video, it's great um, to see you so that we can um, be in a shared space of community together. And then today for our, our four hour meeting today, we do have a few scheduled breaks, but feel free to take breaks as you need them. For questions or comments, uh, whether they're technical or if you need any additional support, you can email safer at waterboards.ca.gov. Also for today's meeting, we've enabled the chat. So if any of the advisory group members have a question for us, you're welcome to send a, a message to the chat and the, the facilitators of the meeting will get that message and can support you out, okay? So that's a new feature. You're welcome to chat us if you have any questions or comments. And then language interpretation. As a reminder, we have oral interpreters providing simultaneous interpretation through Zoom and Spanish. Our interpreter is Viviana, who is um, part of our office. Um, so please remember to speak slowly to ensure that Viviana can capture today's really important conversation. As a reminder, it's important every time um, we, every time we um, switch screens, to, to select your language, either English or Spanish, so that you're able to hear um, the translation that Viviana is gonna provide. All right, so we can move on to our meeting goals for today. So the number one goal of today's meeting is to review the results of the needs assessment. So by the end of this meeting, all of us are gonna have a better understanding of the number of communities in California that are currently failing to provide safe drinking water and the number of communities in California that are at risk of providing safe drinking water. We'll also have a better understanding of how much it's gonna to cost to potentially provide solutions for those communities. This is a really important part of this discussion because once we have a better understanding of what the need in California is, we'll be better able to um, align our funding to match that need. So you'll notice that today's, um, that our advisory group meeting is split up in two parts. So today is part A and part B is on April 22nd. During today's meeting, we are gonna be sharing updates on the SAFER program. So we'll review the timeline and the goals. We'll do a preview of the results of the needs assessment and create an opportunity to um, ask clarifying questions. We'll review the previous draft fund expenditure plan priorities. And we'll review a couple of the discussion questions that we have prepped for the next meeting that we have on April 22nd. So today's, today's meeting is really focused on the results of the needs assessment. The full report of the needs assessment is going to be released tomorrow. So tomorrow you should expect the full report and a summary document. Um, and in between tomorrow and the next time that we meet, April 22nd, you're going to have an opportunity to review the report to brainstorm your feedback and to get, get feedback from your community um, about the needs assessment as well. When we come back on the 22nd, that's really gonna be an opportunity for us to discuss both the needs assessment and um, some questions related to the fund expenditure plan and in a little bit more detail. So that's the reason why we've separated these meetings in part A and part B. Today we'll share the information, we'll have a few weeks to sort of process, digest, and then we'll come back to have a more robust conversation. So as a quick overview of today's outline, um, we'll, after we wrap up our meeting logistics and our welcome, we'll share really quick updates on progress that we've made with the SAFER program. We'll share results of the needs assessment, 
discuss the fund expenditure plan. We'll open up our meeting to hear from members of the public during public comment. And then we'll wrap up with some next steps and um, some key milestones for you to keep in mind. So that's what you should expect during today's meeting. Next, I'm gonna pass the mic to Jessica, who's gonna lead us through introductions. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, so I'd like to welcome um, and congratulate our new advisory group members on their new appointments that we have. Um, for our newly appointed advisory members, we have Castulo Estrada, uh, Emily Rooney, Horacio Amesquita, Jianmin Huang, Jonathan Rash, Maria Luisa Munoz, Michael Rincon, Michael S. Prado Sr., Sandra Chavez, and Jonathan Nelson. And then uh, we have some continuing members who I believe are on the second year of their term, so they were appointed for a two-year term. That would be David Corey, Camille Panu, Don White, Don James, Lucy Hernandez, Isabel Solorio, Everett McGee, excuse me, McGee, and Sergio Carranza. So welcome everyone. We're very excited to have you all join us. Um, there we go. There we go. Um, we're going to do uh, to hear from all of our meeting participants now. Um, when I call your name, if you could unmute yourself and just spend about 15 seconds sharing your name, your affiliation, um, your physical location, and one thing you are looking most forward to with the advisory group this year. So just as an example, uh, my name is Jessica Bean. I'm coming to you from my um, home in Sacramento, and I am looking forward to the Safer Summer series, and we will discuss that with you a little bit later. So that's just a little teaser for you. Um, so we have a lot to get through today. So again, if you could try to keep your response short, that would be great. So let's see, let's start with um, Dawn White. If you wanna come off mute and introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. My name is Dawn White. I work for Golden State Water Company. I'm coming to you from my home in Placerville, California. And I think what I'm most looking forward to is maybe is seeing some case studies or success stories um, that are going to be a result of the SAFER program. Great. Thank you so much, Dawn. Um, how about next we hear from Isabel? Hola, buenos días. Uh, mi nombre es Isabel Solorio. Estoy desde mi casa en la comunidad de Lanare, en el condado de Fresno. ¿Qué es lo que más deseo lograr en este año? Um, que haya soluciones eh, seguras para comunidades rurales, eh, de, eh, específicas en lo que es los problemas del agua. Gracias. Hello, yes, my name is Isabel Soloria and I am coming to you from my home in Lanare in the county of Fresno. And what I am most looking forward to is to uh, having solutions to our uh, rural communities, more specifically as they relate to problems with water. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Um, how about we next hear from Camille? Camille with us? No? Okay. Uh, how about we move on to Everett? Uh, yeah, my name is Everett McGee. I'm in Bakersfield, California with Fuller Acres Water Company. And uh, there's been some issues going on throughout the year, but it's, it's an ongoing, every day something changes. So it's just something ongoing to try and stay on top of things. Great, thanks, Everett. How about Don James? Good afternoon, uh, my name is Don James. I, I'm from here in Sutherland, California. Um, I'm representing the Tallawadini Nation. Um, 
And one thing I hope to get out of this is to learn how this works. Thanks, James. Don. Um, let's see, how about David? Let's see. Yeah, my name is David Corey, um, representing the Central Valley Salinity Coalition. I'm uh, speaking from Dos Palos, California, on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, I think I'm looking forward to just continuing the progress that we uh, that we made last year and, and moving forward to try and get uh, clean, safe, and affordable drinking water to folks within the state. Great, thank you. How about Lucy? Not sure Lucy's joined yet, so maybe we can come back. Okay, thank you so much. How about Sergio? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sergio Carranza with Pueblo Unido CDC, located in the uh, city of La Quinta, California. Um, what I would like to, to achieve for this year is probably uh, uh, make some progress toward streamlining uh, the process of um, funding allocation, approval of funding, and, and deployment of funding to start, uh, you know, construction of uh, specific drinking water projects. Thank you, Sergio. Um, how about Horacio? Hi, uh, my name is Horacio Mesquita. I'm with the San Gerardo Cooperative here in the Salinas Valley. Um, I think uh, I want to see if if we can do some uh, advocating for disadvantaged communities and and uh, domestic wells that that don't even have an application and. Uh, uh, they don't even know how to, to get into the process of getting some help. So we need to reach out to these people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, how about Sandra? Hello, um, I'm Sandra Chavez. I am um, with the Community Water Center of Visalia representing the owners of domestic wells. I'm located in Porterville, California. Well, oh, California. <laughs> and then um, what I'm looking forward to the most this year is just advocating for people who have issues with their domestic wells and also informing people who don't already know that waters with issues, like issues with water exist in California because there's a lot of communities that don't. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, is Castulo with us? Great, Castulo. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Castulo Estrada. I'm a board director with the Coachella Valley Water District, and I work for the city of Coachella. Um, right now, I'm in my office here in the city of Coachella in Riverside County, and I'm really looking forward to the results of the needs assessment. Um, that's, uh, I think, what I'm looking most forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how about Jianmin? Hi, my name is Jianmin Huang. I'm working for Yolo County Environmental Health, the local climacy agency uh, program for um, overseeing small public water systems. What I'm looking forward most this year, since this is my first year, I would like to get to know the program better, get to know other group members better, and hopefully to be part of some Success, successful stories. Thank you. Maria Luisa? Hi. Uh, mi nombre es Maria Luisa Muñoz y yo estoy nueva en este programa en el cual espero aprender mucho para poder ayudar a mi comunidad. Uh, yo gradué del Instituto de Liderazgo de, de aquí, de, de Pricelia y de la comunidad de aquí cerquita y es bajo la compañía SHI de Soho Enterprises. Soy de Baiselia del Noroeste 
y lo que me gustaría es, uh, si puedo, es ayudar a la comunidad en lugares pobres que pertenecen a una vaicelia y siguen tomando agua de lugares que, como pozos. Yo tenía una, un familiar en el pasado y decía que en el verano se secaba su pozo. Entonces quiero como a empaparme más de cómo es el programa y cómo puedo ayudar a esas comunidades, puesto que si tomamos agua saludable, es saludable para todo, todo mundo. Y es lo que me gustaría hacer, pero quiero ir aprendiendo poco a poco, ya que es la primera vez que estoy en este grupo. Yes, hello, my name is Maria Luisa Muñoz. Um, this is my first year with the program. Uh, I am mostly interested in uh, learning more about the program, helping my community. Um, I graduated from a leadership program here in Visalia, Northeastern Visalia. Um, what I most expect to do is help the community, uh, mostly the poor in the Visalia um, and uh, issues with drinking water Uh, wells. I had a family member uh, who had a well and every summer it would dry up. So I really want to get my feet into this. So I really want to get into this and learn more about the program. And I want to help out to provide safe drinking water for everybody. Thank you, Maria Luisa. Uh, how about Jonathan Nelson? E Jonathan? Sure, hi, can you hear me okay? Hola, me pueden oír? Um, oh, before? I think Viviana, you're still on the main channel and Jonathan, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, now I can, thank you. Great, um, before I start, is it possible to provide Uh, Spanish to English interpretation for Spanish speakers whenever they're providing remarks. Um, like, for example, if you had a couple of folks introduce themselves um, via Spanish, it'd be great to make sure that we're providing interpretation. Yes. So if you um, if you can go down at the bottom of your uh, Zoom window, there should be an interpretation feature. If you select the English interpretation, you should be hearing that um, we have been interpreting it into English, but you do have to make sure that you select the English button um, or you won't be hearing that. Does that make okay, sense? Okay, great. Yeah. Totally. Great. Yep. Thanks Absolutely. for that. And that's yeah. available to anyone that's participating in the public? That's available to anyone on Zoom. The folks that are participating in the, uh, from the public have the opportunity to select either the English or the Spanish line and we have two different webcasts of that happening right now um, and they will get the appropriate inter um, interpretation awesome great you guys are all over it great thanks for that so thanks. my name is jonathan nelson I'm the, yeah yeah um my name is jonathan nelson I'm the policy director with the community water center um we are an environmental justice community-based organization fighting for safe clean and affordable drinking water for all californians um i am calling in from a airport uh, in dc Um, why I'm wearing a mask. And um, in terms of what I'm looking forward to most this year, um, looking forward to continuing to empower community voices um, as part of this process. And it's so great to see so many community leaders um, on this advisory group and also to really figuring out how we accelerate um, getting projects and outreach to the communities that need them the most. And as part of that, to working towards having really clear and transparent timelines and plans for how to do that. So thank you all to the State Water Board team for putting this together. Look forward to the conversation. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, how about Michael Prado? I'm sorry, was that for me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, my name is Michael Prado Sr. I live in Sultana, California, which is in Northern Tulare County. I uh, serve as our Sultana Community Services District, CSD, been on the board for 25 years, 12 of those as a presiding president, currently president. And we have consolidated with Munson, which is about three miles south of our community. 
and we serve over there 35 people now and we are going to be tying them in uh, with the interconnection about three miles of pipeline and serve community residents that have contaminated domestic wells along the way and i'm really looking forward to being part of the solution on uh seeking funds for our severely disadvantaged customers and our community to help uh, bring their water bills to currents. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how about Jonathan Rash? And Jonathan, I'm not sure if you're calling in from by phone. Um, you might need to hit star six to unmute. Jonathan Rush had to hop off. Oh, he had to hop off. Okay, thank you. Um, how about we go to Michael Rincon? Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, uh, I'm Michael Rincon. Um, I am the policy researcher at Physicians for Social Responsibility Los Angeles. Uh, we're based in uh, downtown LA and have worked uh, on water issues in Southeast LA, though uh, I personally live in, in, uh, in Thousand Oaks and uh, so in Ventura County. Um, and um, something I'm looking forward to this group for this year. Um, I think really what, what, why we joined was to help bring a different voice that tends to not be heard uh, at the state level, uh, and that is from the communities of Southeast LA who um, are facing a number of, of issues and threats to access to safe and clean drinking water uh, prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that the concerns uh, and issues brought up by community members um, are also being heard in, in other spaces as well. Um, so that is why we're here, or why, why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, and how about Emily? Good afternoon. I'm Emily Rooney representing Agricultural Council of California. I am calling or zooming in from my home in Lodi. Uh, and I think uh, what I'm looking forward to most is diving into the needs assessment and fully understanding the scope of the problem. And I will just piggyback on Jonathan's uh, goals too of attempting to accelerate solutions for the communities we can um, as soon as we can. So um, would be a supporter of establishing timelines and that sort of thing as well. So thank you. And if I have to turn my camera off, it's because I'm dealing with my first grader. So, <laughs> but my intent is to be on the whole time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. I think we all understand. Yeah. Um, well, I really think one of, um, I think that's everyone. I should probably, um, See, is there anyone that maybe jumped on since we started? Of any advisory group members? Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed hearing your responses. And it also just makes me realize that we have a very diverse and ambitious group with us today. Um, and so even though we all come from different backgrounds and physical uh, geographic locations, um, we're all here for um, many of the same things and we share many of the common goals. So I, I'm just really proud to hear that from everyone and I appreciate you sharing. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to um, Adriana so you can walk through our timeline for us. All right, thanks so much, Jessica. And thanks everyone for being here and for introducing yourselves. Really great group. So welcome folks. So um, we're gonna be doing it before we jump into the meat of the needs assessment, we wanted to give a quick update on timeline and a, um, a few additional updates on progress. So you all should have received a calendar, a safer calendar of events in your meeting materials for today's meeting. But I wanna highlight um, a few main processes that you should be aware of for each of the different quarters of this year. What you're gonna notice is that the safer um, process is very cyclical. So for those of you who are returning in the advisory group, you're gonna notice a similar pattern of different processes that we had last year. And next year, it's gonna be a similar flow as well. So in quarter one, which is January through March, that was really focused on completing the, the analysis of the needs assessment and onboarding all of our new advisory group members. Quarter two, which is the one we're in right now, that's really focused on sharing out 
the results of the needs assessment and the draft fund expenditure plan. So this quarter, there's gonna be a lot of different opportunities for, for advisory group members and members of the public to learn more about this and to share their feedback. So we have a couple of upcoming webinars, state water board meetings, community workshops and tribal workshops that are different touch points and opportunities for us to dive deep into the needs assessment and the fund expenditure plan. The third quarter is really um, gonna focus on when the state water board considers the adoption of the fund expenditure plan. So based on all the public comment and feedback, the state water board will revise the fund expenditure plan and then consider it for adoption. And in quarter three is also when we're gonna be reopening up the application process to join the advisory group. In the fourth quarter, we're gonna have an opportunity to have more conversations around affordability. And that's also gonna be the time when, um, when we meet for the last time as a group and where we'll announce the newly appointed advisory group members. So the dates on this slide and the dates on the calendar that you receive, they're tentative, but you should, um, what, is, what is to be expected is the general flow of the process of the SAFER program. Okay? Adriana, we have a question from Michael. Oh, Michael, you've got a, you've got a question on timeline? You can go ahead and unmute yourself, Michael. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, the, the PowerPoint you're showing, I have it on my screen, it's all in Spanish. How do I get English? Yeah, great question. So you're gonna to wanna to navigate to the top of your screen. There should be a green bar. And at that green bar, there should be an arrow. So click that arrow and you can select English PowerPoint. Click the green arrow. Wow. No. On mine, it says view options, and it's actually oh, okay. in a black box next to the green bar. Got it. Got it. Got it. I got my technician here, the grandson. So thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I got it now. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. you know, Great. Let me see. Awesome. So next we wanted to do a couple of quick updates on um, progress or accomplishments. But before we do, does anyone have any quick questions on just the timeline or the general flow of the safer process? Hey, uh, Adriana, do you maybe want to clarify briefly the difference between uh, the first part of our meeting today and the second part of our meeting? Because there was a question that came up uh, in the chat related to that. Yeah, yeah, we could definitely do that. So I think like we mentioned, um, the reason we split up these two meetings is because this meeting is really focused on sharing the results of the needs assessment. The full needs assessment report is gonna be shared with you all tomorrow. So between tomorrow and the next time that we meet, April 22nd, you all are gonna have about two weeks to really read the report, go back to your community, get feedback, generate your own feedback. And then when we come back on the 22nd, the purpose of that meeting is for us to really discuss. So after we've gotten a chance to think about it, think about the questions that we have, um, April 22nd is really just going to be um, discussion based. Does that make sense? And then could you also um, mention what the difference between our two meetings and the April 13th needs assessment webinar? Please. Yeah, that's a great question. So today we're really gonna be taking a high level view of the needs assessment. But if you wanna learn more about the methodology, how they came to um, the numbers, the process that they use, the type of data that was used to inform it, I really encourage you to attend the April 13th webinar on the needs assessment. It's taking place next Tuesday. They're gonna be doing a deep dive to really show you what are the different steps that led up to these numbers that we're gonna be discussing today. So like we mentioned, there's gonna be multiple opportunities for you to, um, to dig into the needs assessment. Today is sort of like a, an initial preview. Does that make sense? Awesome. Yes, yeah, so if, if I may, just quickly. Um, so just to get this straight, so we're gonna have a copy of the, need, of the needs assessment and we're gonna go and meet with our communities and explain this process and try to get feedback so we can reconvene with this feedback 
uh, on April the 22nd. Is that what I hear? That's right. So we'll, okay. we'll release the report and then we have about two minutes to really read the report, get all of our questions. And then when we come back, um, after we've gotten a chance to sit with the information a little bit more, we'll have a discussion about it. Okay, thank you. Castulo? Yes, Adriana, thank you. I just, um, and maybe you touch on this later on, but I just wanted to make sure I, I made the comment. Um, if, if we could get a sense or, or some clarification as to how the risk assessment mapping or how does that play into the needs assessment? Because um, I know at one point there was going to be some sort of, of risk mapping, um, and I'm having a hard time maybe understanding whether that played a role in this needs assessment or whether that's on a whole different timeline. Yeah, that's a great question. That will be answered today. So after we after we review a brief update on safer progress, they're going to be doing an overview of the needs assessment, which includes the risk assessment, the cost assessment and um, the affordability assessment. So there's three pieces that they're gonna be um, presenting on today. So definitely we'll come back to your question. Thank you. Awesome. So let's go ahead and move forward with um, a couple of updates we wanted to share on the SAFER program. So what you see on your screen right now are goals that we have established in the fund expenditure plan. The first goal that we have is related to providing interim safe drinking water to communities who currently don't have safe drinking water. So this goal can include working with technical assistance providers to provide bottled water or point of use devices. The goal that we have in the fund expenditure plan is to provide 150, 150 communities with interim drinking water. And so far we've, we've already exceeded that goal. So currently, um, 312 communities serving over 4,000 people have received interim solutions. So that's a, a really great accomplishment of this program. The second goal that we have here is related to project planning assistance. So this goal is um, to provide planning assistance to 100 communities, and it includes working with technical assistance providers to help water systems begin the process of identifying and planning for solutions in their community. We're really close to meeting our goal and have helped 76 communities who serve 85,000 people to begin planning for their drinking water solutions. So that's a really big um, first step in getting towards a path towards a long-term solution. The third goal that we've got here is for 100 communities to have completed a long-term drinking water solution. So what we mean by long-term drinking water solution is this can include completing a construction project, completing a consolidation or um, the, the, joint, the joining of the merger of two water systems. And our goal um, so far is 39 communities serving 64,000 people have completed a major milestone for their long-term solution. Long-term solutions can take a really long time. So we're really proud of those 39 communities and the progress that they've been able to make. And then the last goal that we've got here is related to return to compliance of safe drinking water standards. So our target is to have 100 communities who are currently not meeting safe drinking water standards to be able to um, meet public health requirements. So currently, 44 communities have been able to return to compliance and are now serving safe drinking water. So we want to say congratulations to those communities because it takes a lot um, to get to that step. So as you can see, these goals really build off of one another. And one of the things that we're planning to do this year is we're planning on sharing these same goals with you every time that we meet so that we can start measuring and tracking progress together. The next two brief accomplishments I wanna mention is one is related to our administrator process and the other is related to our safer website. So as a refresher, an administrator is a person or an entity that is appointed to manage a water system to provide safe drinking water. So the state water board um, has the authority to appoint and fund an administrator for a water system that's currently failing to meet their safe drinking water requirements. And essentially a, an administrator helps that water system get back on track as quickly as possible. 
Um, they're, they're designed to accelerate the process of planning and the process of getting to a long-term solution. So um, beginning in 2020, 11 communities have been notified that their community will be appointed an administrator. And as part of this process, before designating an administrator, we've been holding public meetings with the community to share information about what is an administrator, what are the qualifications of the potential administrator, and we're um, also having these public meetings to hear from the community, to hear public comment, and to answer any questions. Right now, we've been doing this virtually because of the pandemic, um, but we have offered telephone lines for those who don't have internet or can't join us via Zoom. And, we, and in communities um, that speak an additional language, we've also um, provided bilingual uh, interpretation. One thing I wanna note for the administrator process is we're still building out our request for qualifications. So more information about the administrator process, the request for qualifications to be a potential administrator and which communities are currently in the process of getting uh, appointed an administrator, all of that, you can find it on our SAFER website. So our SAFER website, we've recently um, completed a, a revise and a revamp of it. So we really encourage you to check it out and let us know what you think about it and whether it's easy for you to find the information that you're looking for or if there's other information that, um, that you'd like to see on the website. For the website, you wanna go onto waterboards.ca.gov slash SAFER um, to learn more about different aspects of the program. So we wanna pause here and I wanna see if there's any questions, comments about um, either the timeline or any of the updates that we shared. And after we wrap up this question section, um, we'll take a quick five minute break. So does anyone have any questions or comments on what we've just gone over? Sergio? Yes, yes, yes thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, um, there is an echo. I would like to see also as a part of the progress and accomplishment, uh, I think the ultimate goal is to actually see, you know, projects complete, community serves people. Um, so it's definitely a good reflection of the effort, but we also need to quantify um, the progress and accomplishment that we're doing and removing roadblocks right now to get uh, those projects complete because at this point, out of those projects, we don't know how long did it take to get to the point of they are right now. We don't know specifically if those projects have been in, in, the, in the works for five, seven years. So I, I think it will be really important to also include administrative and legislative protocol, internal protocols to, to streamline the mobilization and deployment of, uh, of, of financial resources. So we can say the next time, you know what? The process to actually do an application that normally takes 18 months has been now reduced to six months. Just to give an example, right? Hypothetical. I think that that's something that definitely we need to have a really clear understanding of how this process is effective to make sure that in fact, we are actually expediting uh, the resources that are uh, so needed and that what the community has been waiting for quite some time. So I think it will be my recommendation to include this in, in future uh, progress and, and accomplishment as well. That's a great suggestion. So you're suggesting in addition to having the number of communities that have been returned to compliance, so the number of communities that are now serving safe drinking water or the number of communities that have completed a long-term solution, you'd like to have a little bit more information about individual communities and how long the process has taken. Is that correct? Yeah, but also uh, an, an analysis of the internal process to get those fundings and complete those construction projects, the internal process, because those <laughs> continues to be a, a serious roadblock and, and mobilizing uh, those uh, resources, financial resources to those communities. Great, awesome, that's a great suggestion, thank you. Any other suggestions or questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question, this is Jonathan. Um, well, first of all, just wanna um, second what Sergio just shared. It'd be really helpful 
of an understanding for the projects, you know, for the, the communities that have come back into compliance for safe water in the past year, which is great. We want to see that number continue to go up, but it's to help us understand, like Sujir said, not only how long did it take for them to get to compliance, but, you know, if we could have a baseline, for example, and I'm sure this information is out there, but, you know, did, did we have the same number of systems come back into compliance last year? Um, you know, how is this number different? Is this number lower than the number of systems that have come into compliance last year? So just giving us a little more context about what that trend line is of more systems coming back into compliance in addition to how long it's taking those systems to come back into compliance. And then um, it'd also be great um, for the slide, the summary slide of the goals and the progress towards making those goals. Um, if we could um, break it out a little more to better understand how many of those systems are, you know, for example, domestic wells and state small communities that are being served, um, which we know are among the most um, in, in need communities and also the hardest to reach for multiple different reasons. So if there's a way to um, be able to track and assess how we're meeting the needs of domestic well and state small communities um, as part of tracking these goals, that would be really helpful. And then just lastly, um, on the administrator's um, piece, uh, does the state water board um, have a plan uh, or will be putting together a plan to address the pipeline issues for administrators? Right now, there's not, um, unfortunately, a lot of administrators applying as we understand, there's particularly not necessarily a lot of it, administrators that are applying to be administrators that have community experience. So it'd be great for there to be some discussion and maybe ultimately a plan to put together about how we address that pipeline issue. Thank you. Yeah, really great suggestion, Jonathan. So you're echoing Sergio's point. You'd like to get a little bit more clarification on the breakdown between different types of water systems or, or communities who are receiving assistance. And you'd also like to have a little bit more discussion about um, some of the challenges related to building out the administrator pool. Is that correct? Okay, That's right. awesome. Really great, yeah, really great that. suggestions. Yeah, thanks Any so other much. Idea? Go for it, Horacio. Yeah, also, um, uh, I just uh, wanted to know if, if you guys are doing outreach, uh, and how are, you, how are you guys doing it? Because there's a lot of people that they don't even know about this program. They, they've been uh, just in bottled water for 20, 30 years and, and they're still there, you know? And I would like to know how, do, how, do you, how, do you, how are you planning on, on reaching out to these people that that have contaminated domestic wells, small water systems, and how, do, how are you gonna to get to them? Totally, that's a really great question. So, so far in our safer efforts, we've been really focusing our outreach on local communities, which is why we, um, you may not have seen it on our big social media or in our safer lyrics is because we are really doing targeted outreach with communities and really, the success of that outreach really depends on our local um, community partners and our technical assistance providers who've been working with us to share information about community meetings, flyers, bottled water programs. Um, so we really, the success of, uh, of our outreach really um, is really tied to um, the work of a lot of our technical assistance providers across the state. So we wanna say thank you to them because um, they're really supporting SAFER. In terms of general safer outreach, later on in today's presentation, we're gonna be talking about the Safer Summer Series, which is an opportunity for the general public to um, get to know about the Safer program a little bit more broadly. So this summer, we are gonna have some targeted outreach just for the general public, but when it comes to um, specific communities, we're working with local community partners to share that information out. Does that help answer your question? Yes, uh, yes. just uh, if, you know, maybe uh, you can provide which organizations are doing that so we can refer people to those organizations and get some help. Yeah, that's a great idea. Maybe um, share, share that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Thank you. Board member Firestone. 
Yeah, I was just going to add on that point, because I think it's one thing we didn't put on the slide was that um, out of, uh, of all of this, the drinking water systems on the human right to water list, we have been working with over 90%. We've connected with 90% of them to provide some kind of assistance. So they may not that isn't all reflected in the number of ones that are actually in planning grants, but a lot more are connected to um, technical assistance providers that are working with them to get to the planning stage. Um, so I think, you know, to the point of how are we capturing the additional outreach work of connecting with communities, we're, we're um, that's another metric to just um, share is that you know, I think it's like 92% or over 90% of the systems on the human right to water list um, are, are, are getting some kind of state assistance at this point. Awesome, really good point, um, board member Farsong. Any other questions, comments? Um, I just want to make a note that um, in the previous slide where we're talking about the goals, I'm not sure if I'm able to go back. Okay, the previous slide where I'm able, um, where you're looking at interim solutions, I had mentioned that for interim solutions, um, 312 communities have been provided interim solutions. Uh, my colleague just let me know that of these 312, um, 287 were households, so individual households. So that could mean that individual households received the point of use system. Um, so I want to clarify that it wasn't 312 communities, um, but 312 solutions. Does that make sense? And Jasmine, you're welcome to hop on if, um, if I didn't explain that um, clearly too. Thanks, Adriana. No, that was, that was correct. And I'm sorry, we had a footnote there stating that, but it got lost. So we'll make sure it's on there next time. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Jasmine. Oh, Adriana, you are on mute. So we missed what you were saying there. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. I was just saying that um, next we're going to take a quick five minute break and when we come back we're going to be um, we're going to be diving into the needs assessment so we're going to um, take these next five minutes to pull up the document that um, we're going to be reviewing related to the needs assessment and we'll come back at about um, 155 the screen says 150 but we'll come back in five minutes 155.
All right, welcome back from your break, folks. Kristen, whenever you're ready, you're welcome to kick us off into our needs assessment discussion. Awesome. Turn on my camera for this. You can see my face. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Appold. I am the senior for the needs analysis unit within uh, the SAFER section, the Division of Drinking Water. And uh, we've been in charge of developing the needs assessment. You've heard a lot about it. Um, some of you may have participated in a bunch of our webinars that we've been holding over the last year to develop the core methodologies. Um, but we are literally a day away from sharing the results with the public, with everybody. Um, we're going to be sharing with you today a preview of those results. Um, and you guys, I'm almost crying tears of joy that this is getting out. Uh, so I'm going to spend about the next 30 minutes going over what is the needs assessment? What are they talking about? Uh, what are some of the results? And then what next steps are coming up uh, for this effort? And I'm going to try to talk slowly. But I am a fast talker, so I apologize. Uh, if you can't follow me, just shoot me a little message. I'll try to slow down. Um, and then any questions that you might have, if we have time, I'll try to address those um, at the very end. But there was mention earlier, we are hosting a webinar on Tuesday of next week where we're going to provide a much uh, broader, more in-depth overview of both the methodology and the results of the, the needs assessment. So if you guys can make it, be fantastic if you could register for that webinar. So I'm gonna dive in and this is just some background and I think you guys are gonna get a copy of this document in a little bit. But I wanna start from the beginning. Why, you know, what is this needs assessment? Um, what, you know, what are, how does it fit in with the work that you guys are doing on the advisory group? So as you guys know that your, your feedback is helping to inform the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Funds fund expenditure plan. You know, how are we uh, targeting these $130 million uh, that we have for this fund? If you look at the language in Senate Bill 200, which helped establish the fund and the SAFER program, you'll see that it says that the fund expenditure plan should be drawn from analysis from this thing called a needs assessment. And so the State Water Board has been working with UCLA, and a bunch of subcontractors, some Excuse really me. amazing. Oops, go ahead. I don't have that PowerPoint you're showing, you've been showing at all. Oh, can others see my screen? Is this not visible? Come in. You can see it. You can see it. It should be a document, Michael. It says overview at the top, and it, this has not been shared um, with you guys oh. in an email. Okay, well, that's why I don't have it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I, you know, try to follow along. Um, if you have questions about the content, just let me know. And I think our goal is to get this out to you guys um, tomorrow, if I'm not. Okay. Mistaken. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Okay. So uh, the needs assessment, again, is informing the fund expenditure plan. And we've worked with all of our partners, UCLA, some consulting groups, Pacific Institute, uh, to develop the core methodologies of the needs assessment. And there are three core pieces of the needs assessment. So I wish I had some visual aids that were more exciting than the text here, but um, there are three pieces, which is the risk assessment, where we're identifying uh, water systems and domestic wells that are at risk of failure. And we define what that means, which is a fairly broad term here. We do a cost assessment where we're trying to identify, well, what's the price tag? How is it gonna how much is it going to cost the state and um, communities to fix the problems, to come back into compliance, to not be at risk? Uh, and that's a big price tag, as you can imagine. And then we look at, well, how much funding do we have available at the state water board, the funds that we have control over? Uh, what is the gap going to be? And so we're going to, um, we're going to, walk through kind of what those results are and hopefully this will help inform your discussions as you're talking about this next year's fund expenditure plan. But before I start talking about the risk assessment, I think it's always good to start with our human right to water list, our failing water systems. You know, you guys have heard about these systems. Um, it's been a, a big 
uh, program push for the state water board to really make sure that we're providing assistance quickly to our failing water systems, those on the human right to water list. Um, one of the things that we recently did, um, this was back in December, was we proposed expanding the criteria that gets you onto the failing list. So before it was, you had to have a primary um, or secondary MCL violation, which means you have uh, contaminants in your water and you're triggering the, the safety threshold. We've expanded the criteria to a few um, additional things, like if you have monitoring and reporting violations that haven't been addressed, and you've had a lot of them, if you've had treatment technique violations um, and some other things. And the expansion of this criteria really helps us uh, align our definition of failing with the human right to water, with the goals and the things that you guys are working on. And so if you take a look, we actually have a bunch of papers out on this on our, our website, and we can share those with you, um, what this expanded criteria looks like. Um, but we're, we're releasing that um, tomorrow as well and probably adding um, just a few more systems to the human right to water list. It's important that we talk about the human right to water list because we're trying to be proactive at the state water board and keeping systems off the list. Um, we have about 45 unique water systems that come on to the, the failing list each year. And we, we wanna bring that number down. And so to do that, we need to identify those water systems that are at risk of failing. And so we developed with UCLA a risk assessment to do that. Now, our goal was to develop a risk assessment for public water systems, state small water systems, which are those really tiny ones, and domestic wells. But as you can imagine, the data that we have for all those different types of systems is very different. And so we had to create two different methodologies uh, to, to identify our at-risk public water systems and then the state smalls and domestic wells. So you'll see that in the report, it's kind of broken up into two batches. Um, and if you have questions about that, you just let me know. So for public water systems, we used 19 metrics what we call risk indicators, to try to figure out what systems are at risk of failing. And I know a lot of you participated in our webinar workshops where we developed this method methodology and you helped us choose these metrics and we really appreciate your help. Um, these metrics are broken up into four different categories. We look at the risk around water quality. We look at risk around accessibility. You know, are you in a drought area? Do you only have one source? Um, we look at risk around affordability. Uh, are your rate payers struggling potentially to pay their water bills, which would hurt your financial capacity? And then we look at technical managerial and financial capacity. You know, is your water system run well? Uh, you know, have you had operator certification violations? Have you had any significant deficiencies? And if you're not scoring well across a breadth of these indicators, then we have uh, found you to be at risk. That was what we did for public water systems. And again, if you tune in on Tuesday, we'll go into that a little bit um, deeper. For state small water systems and domestic wells, we have very limited data. And so what um, our division of water quality did was they developed an aquifer risk map uh, that looked at groundwater samples from across the state at a depth that most domestic wells or state small water systems would be drawing their water from to identify areas where domestic wells and state smalls may be drawing contaminated water. So this is based on modeling, um, but we did identify areas of high risk where potentially these water systems and well owners may wanna get their water sampled to confirm whether or not it's contaminated. You'll see in the table that I'm sharing, and I hope you can read it, zoom in just one more. You'll see that for public water systems, we analyzed 2,800, 2,800 water systems. We focused our assessment on the small water systems. So those that have 3,300 connections or less. And we found 617 systems are at risk. Using the aquifer risk map, we identified 611 state small water systems that may be at risk, and we found uh, nearly uh, 78,000 domestic wells that may be at risk. 
Okay. Now, I, we wanted to include tribal water systems in our needs assessment. Uh, we have limited data on tribal water systems, so we couldn't apply the exact same approach that we did for public water systems to tribal systems, but we weren't gonna leave them out. Uh, so we developed an alternative approach for identifying human right to water equivalent and at-risk equivalent tribal water systems. And working with US EPA and other partners, we found that there's probably about 13 tribal systems that would maybe be meeting our human right to water criteria and 22 at-risk equivalent tribal water systems. And this was important because we wanted to develop a cost estimate for those systems so they're not left out of your discussions for the fund expenditure plan. So now we have our list of systems, right? We know which systems are failing. We know which systems now are, are at risk for both public water systems, state smalls, and domestic wells. Then we need to figure out, well, what's that price tag? How much does it cost to provide interim and long-term solutions to these communities? And this was an extensive process. Again, if any of you participated in our webinars, you, you would see um, the amount of effort that went into creating the model to try to estimate these costs. If you look at this table here, you'll see that these are capital cost ranges. Now, it's a large range, you'll see from the minimum to maximum. And that's because we have uh, an engineering um, a differentiator that helps us you know, take into account there could be ups and downs. So we have a point estimate that's actually in the paper that you can use too, but we wanted to show you the range. These capital costs are a subset of the total cost because we also looked at O&M for human right to water systems. We looked at other infrastructure needs that relate to um, other infrastructure upgrades that probably need to happen at that water system to make them more resilient, right? So sometimes backup energy, maybe another well needs to be drilled. So there's other infrastructure costs that were also calculated that aren't in this table. Um, I just wanted to point out that we did a ton of stakeholder engagement in refining our model and our costs, and we got a lot of really great feedback on what should be included and not included in this cost model, and we tried to incorporate all of that feedback um, into it, so that's what these results reflect. And you'll see here quite a bit of range, our total just capital costs alone, uh, anywhere between $2.3 billion to $9 billion. Now, obviously that's a, a subset of the cost. I really encourage you to take a look at the full paper that comes out tomorrow. Um, but the next step we had to do after we identified, well, what's the big price tag um, is say, okay, you know, well, what funding do we have available that we have control over? Um, what are the needs gonna be looking forward into the future? How big of a funding gap is there? Um, you know, cause that needs to weigh in on how we prioritize uh, our programs. And so what we did was we estimated how many systems are gonna be coming onto the human right to water list and the at-risk list over the next five years. Um, like I said earlier, we, uh, we estimate about 47 new human right to water systems each year. And then we've done the same proportion for at-risk public water systems as well. And then we calculated what the total cost would be for all of those systems for five years. And then you have to look at, okay, of, the, of all the costs, right? You've got a big price tag. Um, a lot of you know that when you come to the state water board for funding assistance, um, depending on the demographics of your water system and your project, you may qualify for certain percentages of grant, certain percentages of loan, um, some pieces of it, the water system is gonna have to uh, bring to the table uh, if they can't get a full grant. So we looked at the funding eligibilities that the state water board already has uh, for project financing. And we broke up the project costs by how much are eligible for grants and how much are eligible for loans and what's typically not eligible for a grant or a loan. And if you look at this table, you'll see that we have grant eligible needs. So of the total price tag, we estimate that there's $3.25 billion of estimated grant needs, but over the next five years, state water board grant dollars um, is only $1.2 billion. So we anticipate that there's a grant funding gap of $2.05 billion. 
But what I really want to stress and emphasize here is that, again, this analysis was only looking at grant dollars that the state water board manages. It does not look at the full breadth of funding that's out there to support these communities. And that's important because if the water board doesn't have the money, it doesn't mean that this is not available. We do have in our report a whole table in our appendix of a bunch of other programs that could be used to help support these needs. So this is not meaning that there's not money out there. There could be definitely money out there. Um, and the same is true on the loan side. If you look at this table here, um, the local cost share, which is loan, you know, the loan eligible piece is $4.05 billion over the next five years. But the State Water Board's loan capacity, if you're looking at the drinking water SRF over the next five years is 1.5 billion. So there's a financing gap of the State Water Board's programs of $2.55 billion. Again, there are other loan programs out there um, that may be able to help fill some of these gaps. Again, I, uh, there's a lot more tables and information in our final report. I know it can probably be an overwhelming look at all these numbers, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have to really understand this. Um, again, our tribal water systems were not left out of our analysis um, looking for costs and risk, um, but we did leave them out of the gap analysis. And that was because a lot of tribal water systems have access to federal um, tribal grant programs that we weren't able to incorporate in the gap analysis. So if we were to, to try to include them, it would be really misleading. Um, but we did, again, want to make sure that their costs were included here so that you can see them and consider them um, in your discussions. And last but not least, I appreciate you uh, sticking with me on all of this, was our affordability assessment. Um, in our affordability assessment, what we're trying to do is look at community water systems across the state. And we looked at different metrics to try to figure out what communities may be struggling with affordability challenges. Now, when you get this handout, you'll see a little diagram with some definitions. And I'm gonna just spend a little bit of time walking you through this today, because I think it's really important. You know, SB 200 uh, calls out, says that the fund expenditure plan needs to list these systems that are um, that are exceeding uh, an air quote affordability threshold. But there isn't really a definition anywhere that really explains, well, what is affordability? What is an affordability threshold? Like, what are we talking about? And so the State Water Board has been spending a lot of time uh, working with our partners, uh, talking amongst ourselves, uh, thinking through affordability. And we have definitions that I really want you to consider when you're, when you're thinking about affordability. There really is what I like to call like a nexus of affordability lenses where you, where you consider these challenges. Um, I think a lot of times when we talk about affordability, a lot of people's minds go straight to household. You know, are people struggling to pay their water bill, right? That's household affordability. You know, can I pay my bill or not? Um, can I have access to safe drinking water? There's also community level affordability. It's the ability of the collective community to pay their water bills so that they can support their water system. So can enough households within the community pay for their water services so that the water system has enough funding to meet its long-term and short-term financial needs, right? And that plays into the water system. If you're looking at affordability from a water systems perspective, they wanna know, do they have the financial capacity to provide safe drinking water to their community, to households? Um, if they have a lot of uh, ratepayers who are unable to pay their bills, uh, their financial capacity becomes rocky and it's difficult for them to make the type of investments they need to make uh, to sustain their water system. And so it's all very cyclical. If a water system struggles to uh, make the investments that they need to make, it then is difficult for households to get safe water. If a water system has to increase their water rates, right, in order to pay for infrastructure, that can cause household affordability issues. So when we're looking at how do we measure affordability, the question is, you know, are we looking at each one of these levels of affordability? Is it just one or do we look at all three? And so when we were trying to come up with um, 
a better approach for assessing affordability this year, um, we looked at a bunch of different indicators and we had the public's input during our workshops this year. It was very helpful. Lots of great suggestions. Unfortunately, we're very limited in the data that we actually can use. And so we were able to choose three uh, affordability indicators or metrics data points um, to use for our affordability assessment this year. So percent median household income is a metric that was used last year uh, in the fund expenditure plan and we're using it again this year. If you're not familiar with it, the way I like to describe it is it's annually looking at a year how much is a household paying of their income to pay for water services? Is it 1% of their income? Is it 2% of their income? Is it 5% of their income, their annual income? If a person, you know, if a household is spending more and more and more of their annual income on uh, drinking water services, it obviously can start becoming um, unaffordable. Now the water board has a, a threshold or a number that it's used historically uh, for making decisions around affordability using this metric. And they've used one and a half percent and others have used two and a half percent. So we use both um, to gauge affordability with this indicator. Um, extreme water bill, our second indicator, uh, is looking at the total water bill for that water system and is it high or low compared to the rest of the water systems in the state? So if the water system has water bills that exceed 150%, 200% of the statewide average, then those customers may be uh, dealing with affordability challenges. The last one here is percent shutoffs due to non-payment. And what we're looking at here is what percentage of a water system's customer base have experienced shutoffs due to non-payment within a year? And for this, I wanna stress that we use 2019 data. A lot of you may be familiar with the moratorium on shutoffs that were initiated due to the COVID pandemic this past year. So we were using 2019 data for this, um, but moving forward, obviously that, that's gonna change. But we use all three of these metrics together to try to gauge affordability challenges. Um, they were weighed the same. We looked at them equally. Um, SB 200 says that we particularly need to call out um, disadvantaged communities and severely disadvantaged communities that are, um, that are meeting these affordability thresholds. You'll see here um, in the dark green, and let me just zoom in as much as I can, if this is helpful. You'll see that um, a lot of uh, DAC and SDAC systems, we had about four, over 400, exceeded the percent median household income threshold for extreme water bill, um, a little bit less, and then um, very few for percent, percent shutoffs. And that was looking at them individually. And then we were saying, okay, well, what about systems that exceeded the threshold for more than one indicator. Those ones may be really struggling. Um, so we wanted to take a look at the number of systems that were exceeding multiple thresholds. And you can see here, a good chunk of water systems assessed here did not exceed any threshold. So we're considered affordable. We had um, a few systems that had one, two, and then three, you can see you know, all three indicators they exceeded the threshold are down here. And again, we're going to be releasing all of this information tomorrow, including spreadsheets that have the full list of water systems that exceeded these thresholds. So if you want to see which water systems that were part of our analysis exceeded, you know, the thresholds here, or maybe all three of them, you can use our spreadsheets to do that. And I'm happy to walk you guys through how to navigate those if you're interested. Okay, and that's all for the high level results of the needs assessment. Um, I'm really excited to share this information with you guys. It's been a long process to get here um, and I hope it's useful for your conversations. Um, again, if you wanna learn more, please tune in on Tuesday. Um, we're probably gonna be hosting a brown bag session as well to dive into the spreadsheets so you can learn how to navigate those because that's gonna be a whole nother, another thing. Um, the, I forgot to mention on the risk assessment,
piece, like we are posting spreadsheets with a list of water systems that are at risk. So you'll be able to search for them and you'll be able to identify why they're on the at risk list. So if you see a water system that you're familiar with and you're curious what got them on the list, you'll be able to see, oh, it was because of these different water quality indicators or maybe TMF capacity issues. Um, so anyway, I hope that's helpful. And we, I think we have time for some questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kristen, for your presentation today and for all your work getting up to this point. So we do have time for question and answer. Um, and so if you could please raise your hand on via Zoom, we'll call people um, based on the different order. So you can raise your hand by going at the bottom of your screen. There should be a, um, an icon that says reactions. It should be a little smiley face. Click on that little smiley face reactions and there should, there should be an option to raise your hand. So go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question, comment, or if you wanna learn more about something that Kristen mentioned. If you're calling on the phone, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and hit um, star nine and that'll, go, and that'll raise your hands. Um, and then one final reminder, because Kristen is sharing her screen, you have to reselect your audio. So please go, um, if, you if, you are, if your audio hasn't yet been selected, go ahead and click interpretation using the globe. Um, and select either English or Spanish. Um, if you're listening in in English, it is important for you to select English so that you can hear um, the, in, um, the interpretation for um, comments shared by uh, Spanish speakers. All right, so we can go ahead and get started with Gastulo. You're welcome to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, Chris, and thank you for your presentation. I, I, I have a, a few general comments and I'm going to try to summarize them and, and hopefully one question or a statement. And maybe the, the answer is that it's a type of question that will be more, um, maybe a type of question for the, for, the, for the next workshop where we're going to get into the details. But I wanted to share that um, one of the things that I kind of, that kind of stood out to me as part of the workshops that we were having, I think, as part of the effort to come up with the needs assessment and doing the risk mapping, the tools that were kind of being used to put that together, perhaps what you're calling the aquifer for risk map. One of the things that I noticed was that it almost seemed like the, the, the tools, for example, I'm gonna take our region, for example, would look at, let's say, the Coachella Valley Water District or any um, water district across California and kind of look at the public water system. And if, and if it didn't meet the different um, criteria that you mentioned that would kind of flag it as, as being at risk, it, would, it, it, almost, it almost made it seem like it would put it to the side and say, there's no issue. But a lot of times you have these small water systems or state um, uh, wells within that within the boundary of those public water systems. And it seemed like when it, when it kind of checked them off as saying, well, there's not an issue, it, it, it didn't really hone in on the kind of going more deeper into that, right? And so I just kind of wanted to get a sense um, uh, how that was resolved. The, the, other, the other comment I had was, um, I, I wanted to ask in general, the, would, would you say that, uh, the numbers that we just went through right now was more specifically concentrated on the on the public water systems. I, I know that at the beginning you kind of talked about, um, you know, kind of there being two two separate kind of methodologies. One was for the public water system, and one was to kind of try to hone in on the on the small water systems and the state wells. And I, I just wanted to get a sense if, in your opinion, most of what you touched on the statistics. Um, were more so related to the public water systems. And then also, when we talk about the affordability threshold, when we talk about the number of shutoffs uh, to try to get a sense of all these different indicators, uh, medium household income, how, how do you deal with, um, with systems uh, per, like in our region where it covers such a big area where on one side, you know, you have um, maybe a medium, a medium household income of like, let's say $200,000 per year. And on the other side, you probably have a, a medium household income of, um, of let's say, you know, $20,000 per year. 
Um, is, is that kind of addressed separately? Do those two scenarios exist um, on one side on the public water system, but then for, for systems that are not part of the system, do you look at them differently or do you, do you miss them? I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out how that was addressed because I, I think I recall, as I mentioned during the workshops that it seemed like the tools um, weren't really kind of making that, that distinction. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Again, I, I have a lot of thoughts and I just I hope it makes sense. <laughs> they do make sense. And I can I ask a clarifying question on your first question um, before sure. I dig in? So you were talking about, you know, you mentioned the aquifer risk map and kind of, um, you know, different systems around the Coachella Valley Water District system, right? I'm curious, were you being specific about a state small a domestic well or a public water system there? Or is it kind of all, uh, of, them? all of them? I, I all of them. because okay. I, I recall that as part of the mapping, um, there was, I recall you showed, a, there was a map that, that showed all the public water systems and then it tried to focus on the areas that weren't covered by those, by those um, boundaries. And I think that's where you, where it was an indicator that these were areas that weren't served by a public water system. And so they, they had, but you knew there was population there. So you knew that those areas had to be served by some sort of water system, whether it was a state small or a, right. or a, or a small water system. And so okay. the, issue, the issue that I saw was that there's instances where you have a bunch of small water systems and state small systems within public system water boundaries, but they're not connected to the system. And right. so how do you capture those? Right, okay. So the, I have three main questions and I'll try to get through them because I know other folks have questions too. So um, our risk assessment for public water systems, which used the 19 indicators, it did not rely on any mapping. We used um, that approach for the public water systems that are in SIDWIS, 3,300 service connections or less that are public water systems or K through 12 schools. For the risk assessment for state smalls and domestic wells, that was done using all available data that we have to identify where state smalls and domestic wells may be. And you can imagine our data set there is really all over the place. Um, but we did our best. We used an R, you know, RCAC had developed a data set on state smalls and domestic wells, and Gamma has their maps. Um, I will tell you what we are doing right now is there as part of SB 200, there is a requirement that counties uh, submit to the state water board their domestic well and state small water quality data and location data to us. And so we are actually collecting that data right now and that will help improve our location information so that and basic information on these water systems so we'll have a better risk assessment for years to come. Um, but we did not do as part of our risk assessment or cost assessment or affordability assessment, any sort of interrelational piece, um, you know, for trying to identify risk for these systems. But what we did do, what we did do is we looked at the location of state smalls and domestic wells as they relate to water systems for consolidation potential. If you look at, if you review our cost assessment results, um, in the paper, you'll see that what we did was we looked at using GIS, we looked at the location of these systems um, and whether or not consolidation was possible. If a state smaller domestic well was in a three, a three mile piped location of a water system boundary, then we considered them potentially a consolidation project if, it, if our model showed that that was a good long-term solution for that system. Um, so we did do that, uh, and that is part of our analysis. So I hope that gets a little bit at your question, but if not, like maybe you and I can follow up afterwards. Um, you ask another question around, you know, well, which what systems were included in what um, on all this analysis? And I know it's really confusing because there's a lot going on. Um, the risk assessment, like I said, public water systems, 3,300 service connections or less, um, domestic wells and state small systems. The cost assessment looked at all of those systems that were considered at risk 
and human right to water systems. So you can see that here in the table. So human right to water, at risk public water systems, state smalls, domestic wells. So we have their cost numbers there. The affordability assessment looked at all community water systems in the state, large and small. So a very different inventory of water systems. It did not look at domestic wells. So that was not included in community water, in the community water system affordability assessment. And again, we, we do spell all of that out in the paper and I know it's hard to follow. So, um, but it was a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank um, you, Kristen. Then, no. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say thank you. That that helps. And if um, okay. we need to connect offline to get a bit, and we'll, we'll, we'll have an opportunity obviously to provide feedback and comments. And I, I, I think, you know, that's a good opportunity for us to follow up. Great. Well, thank you. You did have one last question on affordability, which I can speak to briefly. Um, you asked, you know, you could have a water system, and this is true for larger urban water systems in particular, where you could have some pockets of communities that have really high uh, income and others that have low income. And how does our affordability assessment, uh, does it address those challenges? And right now, um, what it does is our median household income is what it is for the water system boundary that we have on file. So we kind of use the water system boundary as a cookie cutter over the, the US census income data to try to assess what that median household income is within the service area of that water system. Um, so that is documented in our paper, um, but we hope over the next year or two that we can develop a more robust affordability assessment that can get more granular. So, so, so it sounds like you're saying it, it's it's an average mm -hmm. of within the within, within the, the boundary. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Really great questions, Castillo. Thank you, Horacio. Yes, I, I have some questions. Uh, the data that you're collecting from the counties. Is that data going to be uh, public or is it going to be just for the state water board? It will be public. Yeah. Is it difficult to uh, navigate or is it simple? Uh, we will try to make it as simple as possible. We are building a new system now to collect that data and to put it into a format that then will make it accessible when we share it with the public. So we're doing our best to make it as accessible as possible. Okay, that would be interesting because of the GSAs, we're having problems in, in knowing which wells are, where's the location of the wells, and uh, we have problems with arsenic and TCP and nitrate, so that data will help us. Also, uh, you, you mentioned that the affordability uh, what, what, what's the status on the affordability? Is it, are people gonna get help and who, who cannot pay their water bill or? Well, I'm sure our friends within DFA can speak a little bit more to this, but really, I mean, the affordability assessment, again, is supposed to kind of help inform, um, you know, how, uh, how um, we prioritize the, the funding and technical assistance within the fund expenditure plan. I think I mentioned that median household income is often used by, um, by DFA to help indicate whether or not a system or a borrower uh, gets um, maybe more grant funding um, or less. I know that there's, um, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll let others speak to it because I don't want to miss I don't want to uh, misinterpret anything, but um, it is something that the water board is is looking at. I think, yeah, and I'm seeing some some talk in our chat potentially. Um, I think we'll probably share at future meetings some of the ideas that the water board's been tossing around on this topic. That's a good question. I'm glad you brought it up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Really great questions, Horacio. So yes, the, it, it looks like we're, we're getting information about state smalls, which will be publicly accessible. So hopefully that'll be able to help not just drinking water, but groundwater sustainability agency planning efforts. That's a great question. 
And at future meetings, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to dive deeper into affordability, specifically in the later part of this year. So next we've got Jonathan Nelson. Hi everyone, can you hear me? I'm just phone yes. only at this point. Okay, great. Um, so first of all, this is really exciting to see um, and um, just clear how much work went into this, um, both just from the summary and um, all the, the meetings. So just thank you um, everyone that worked on this, particularly Christian and your team. Um, one quick question um, for the report that's gonna come out, um, it sounds like tomorrow, um, if I heard that correctly. Um, is the report going to break down these really big numbers, you know, 2.5 billion um, into sort of more to into components, such as, for example, when we think about drought and water shortage resiliency, um, is that um, going to be a subset amount um, of that total figure, you know, 500 million to address you know, water supply and drought resiliency for communities, or is it just gonna be this overall big aggregate number and that's that's what we'll get? That, that's that a fantastic sense? question. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and we've, we have received questions about that um, during our methodology development too. Um, I wish I could say that we could do that or that we did break it out by um, kind of resiliency buckets of need. Uh, but we didn't, um, mostly because I think we would need more site-specific information about the water system, whether or not they really were facing drought um, issues. Uh, so it, hopefully we'll have maybe that information in the future to, to be able to do that. Um, but what we did do um, is break out the needs, um, both by water system type. So you can look at what are the state small needs, what are the domestic well needs, but we also broke it out by the different um, categories, the tiers of prioritization that are used in the fund expenditure plan. So um, you'll see uh, consolidation projects, you'll see interim assistance, you'll see um, you'll see uh, treatment projects for uh, for systems that have a primary MCL uh, violation. You'll see O and M operations and maintenance. So we did break it out by those those different types of categories, which have been used um, as priority priority categories in the fund expenditure plan. Um, okay, that's really helpful. Um, I, just maybe one co quick comment, comment then, which is that you know because we're in a drought year, um, and because there's just a real both need to continue to address drought and water supply resiliency in frontline communities and the fact that this will be increasingly um, discussed and sort of front and center, unfortunately, because of the drought conditions this year, it'd be really great to explore how we can work towards being able to pull out from this um, big aggregate number, um, uh, a more discrete subset number that looks at drought and water shortage resiliency. And we'd really appreciate the opportunity to hopefully be able to work with you and the water board on that in the, the coming weeks. Absolutely. Yeah, it's something we'd like to focus on too. We're trying to really get at source capacity issues. So it's a great comment, thank you. Kristen, can I just add Thanks. on that? Sorry, um, I just thought I'd add, you know, there's so much in this report that, you know, as, and Kristen is doing a great job breaking this down. Um, so there'll be a lot to follow up on, but on that, um, that question, I do think one thing to take a look at as you dive in is there is a category of um, capital costs that include, that are um, referred to in, in it as, um, and broken out um, as, um, what is it? Other essential infrastructure, I think. And yeah. so a lot of those costs, when you, you know, go into it are things that would be considered resiliency measures. So they might be a storage tank or getting, um, you know, addressing, uh, getting meters in place and these sorts of things that for the, the sort of drought resiliency measures um, would be the kinds of costs and, and things that might be in there. So it's not a perfect breakout, but I think just wanted to, to flag that as you dig in 
um, to all of the meaty stuff here to, to take a closer look at if that's the kind of thing that you're interested in. Right. Really helpful, thanks. Awesome, thank you three. We've got a question from Michael Rincon in the chat. Just quick clarification. So the results of this needs assessment was based off pre-pandemic conditions. That is correct, yes. Um, okay, because I'm um, sorry if, if, if I'm speaking out of term or not. But, um, Go for it. Yeah, so I mean, this is all great, you know, everything that you're sharing and all that. But I think, you know, um, the, if that is the case that this is mostly pre-pandemic conditions, then the situation that the water systems, water customers, and, and overall just the state of California in general, just we're in a, in a different situation now. And even though that we're heading towards the end of this pandemic, you know, we're not in a sense going back to those same conditions. So um, I'm not trying to, you know, say that, that we have to start over, but I think we might have to reevaluate these uh, values to, or in a sense, update them to, to the demand required by the, uh, the individual water systems to ensure that they continue to provide safe and clean drinking water, address the accumulated uh, rearages by the, the customers, which, you know, back in January, it was uh, almost a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know where it's at now, really. Um, so, there are, I believe, minorities. And I think that before this, you know, I mean, I, I look forward to, to seeing what, what information is available, you know, off of the report tomorrow. But um, what is in the back of my mind is, is okay, so, uh, but how do we address the issues that we're dealing with now today, which, you know, in a year, it is now a much very difficult. And now adding on also that it, like John was saying, it is a drought year. It is a La Nina year. So, yeah. oh yeah, the fund never ends. So we gotta, we gotta be a little bit more proactive and just making sure that, um, that, you know, we're, we are preparing the state to address um, the issues of tomorrow that we are expecting now, not of what we expected yeah. then. Totally agree with you. Um, you know, our data comes from a lot of different sources and you're speaking directly to kind of our financial related data, um, which all comes through our electronic annual report. Um, and we just opened up the 2020 reporting year electronic annual report just two weeks ago. Um, so we're starting to get more of that financial information that's gonna reflect the hardships that a lot of systems face during this pandemic year. Um, we also have expanded our, um, our electronic annual report to capture more, more data, more information related to financial capacity of water systems so that we can include that in future iterations of the risk assessment and the full needs assessment, including affordability assessment. Um, we are, uh, you know, this is an annual report. Um, you know, we, this is an iterative process. We're going to be updating uh, the needs assessment uh, and always trying to fine tune it and improve both the data that's in it, but also the methodology. And your recommendations and feedback on that is really critical to the success of this effort um, as, it, as it continues year after year. So I appreciate your feedback. I think um, I, you're, you also referred to our COVID survey that we did the financial impact survey. Um, it's a good thing to take a look at if you haven't, if you haven't looked at it, it's a good thing to consider. So thank you, Michael. Yeah, I wanna echo what Kristen said. I think that that feedback is really spot on. And I think um, diving deeper into that conversation is what our April 22nd meeting is really going to be about, right? So now that we have this information, how do we reconcile the need in our state with the data that we have with our current reality? that we're in a pandemic, um, that we are approaching a drought. So how do we align our funding needs? So thanks for bringing that up so that we can start that conversation now and, and continue it next time that we come back together. Um, Michael Prado, I see that you've got your hand up. If you wanna come, uh, come off mute.
I think, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we're able to hear you. Go for it. I think uh, everything that I was going to bring up here, uh, just the last few people, there's a lot of the things I was concerned with. One of my biggest concern um, is um, for the severely disadvantaged communities that have under 300 connections, are uh, they getting involved in any of your data you're recording? Yep, there are priority systems. The 3,300 connections or less are the ones that we focused on is those small systems. And that's a, it's an important point to make, um, you know, the results of the full needs assessment are really only looking at a small subset of all of the water systems in the state. Um, so we hope that folks keep that in mind, especially when they're looking at our cost numbers um, and the gap analysis results. Okay. But yes, we did, in, we did include them. Now, the other thing, um, I know there's a quite a few senior citizens, let's say, that live off you know, Social Security and SSI or retirement, whichever it may be. But they're elderly people that their wells have gone dry and are getting potable water provided. But their anxiety, their everything, their health is just diminishing more. Is there going to be help for those uh, senior citizens, let's say, a bracket for maybe have a, some type of a loan process? Uh, so eligibilities for the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund extends to domestic wall owners. Um, so if folks are looking for assistance, we really encourage them to reach out uh, to DFA, to our Division of Financial Assistance, and we can put you in contact with the right people to get those conversations going. Okay. We also can offer technical assistance to state smalls and domestic walls as well, in okay. addition to the financial assistance. I will guide them in the direction. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. And I think your, your comment is something we can also circle back on when we talk about affordability um, and, and dig deeper into that as well. Um, Jonathan Nelson, I see your hand is up. Do you have a new question or maybe is it a remainder hand? No more questions. Okay, awesome. Great. Do other folks have any questions for Kristen or any comments or reflections on what you've heard either from fellow advisory group members or in the presentation? And again, a reminder, if you wanna raise your hand at the bottom of your screen, there should be a, an icon, a smiley face icon. It has reactions. Click on the smiley face, raise your hand. If you're calling by phone, star nine. Horacio, go for it. Yeah, um, you're talking about the list of the human right to water. Is, is that all the water systems and domestic systems that are included there or there are a lot of missing wells that are not counted for? That's a great question. So the human right to water list or failing criteria um, is only a, applying to our, uh, our community water systems K through 12 schools. Um, so that is a, a much limited look um, for our human right to water list systems. It does not look at domestic wells. So that's a good question. Is, do you think it's possible to, to get a good count of all the wells in California and, and which ones are have clean water? Which ones are have polluted water? Is it possible? I, I wish <laughs> we're we're working towards it, but it's going to be a very long journey. Um, you know, domestic wells are not required to test their water quality. Um, tip, you know, and it it changes county by county because counties regulate um, kind of the permitting of new wells. Um, so sometimes when a new well is being built, a county will require um, a water quality sample be taken, um, but then that's typically it. Um, sometimes counties have a voluntary uh, domestic well monitoring programs where they'll come out and you, know, you can take samples 
on a more regular basis, but they're voluntary, you know, usually a homeowner needs to sign up for it. Um, so our data, even the data that we're going to be collecting through this new effort, is still going to be very limited on the water quality side um, and even on the location side, because a lot of, you know, this is data that really historically hasn't been required to be, you know, well documented. And so we're working with counties to try to um, streamline um, how this data uh, is collected and then um, uh, provided to the state. So we hope to see improvement over time. Um, and so I wanted to, to see if um, Michelle, who's my supervisor, wanted to add anything more to this. Horacio, thank you for the question. I just wanted to point out that when you look and um, on this domestic well section here, that they analyzed approximately uh, 300,000 more or less uh, wells in the state. They, they didn't analyze them individually, but they analyzed sort of the regions of where they are. And of those, they found that approximately um, 78,000 of them were in a region that was high risk for contamination. So I think to some extent, this what you're getting at was actually done. It's not done on an individual well by well basis, but it's done sort of regionally across the state. And then we have areas, and when you look at the report, we have areas where, um, you know, you can see it, this area is red and there's, you know, X number of wells within that area. So, um, that are approximated. So these are approximated and then they went through and tried to do cost estimates for those 78,000 wells that may be contaminated. So that is part of the cost estimate and part of the risk assessment. So we, we, it's not technically called the human right to water list systems, but they're certainly being captured in this risk assessment. We actually call them at risk domestic wells and at-risk state smalls. Um, but when we, and, and we use that term a little bit differently for community water systems than we do state smalls and domestic wells. The at-risk domestic wells and state smalls have a very high probability of having contamination. That said, we can't ever know without going to an individual well and sampling it. Does that help? Yes. Um... Yes, I said that um, it seems like there's more data to be collected because uh, when we ask locally here, they they don't have information on domestic wells. I, there definitely is more data to be collected. I think that's a good point. And, and they used, um, I don't know if we have anyone from our gamma team, but they also used public water system wells that are shallow to sort of correlate where contamination might be across the state. So it wasn't just based on domestic well data, it was also based on public, you know, shallow public water system where there's overlap between the public water system well and the, like, the likely area that a domestic well would pull from. So yeah, there's definitely a lot more work to be done in this, in getting better data, but I just want, I didn't want you to think that it was excluded from the process. No, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Michelle. Any other questions? All right, I think that wraps up our no, question. No, no, no questions from the Spanish speakers. Awesome. Thank you, Viviana. Thank you, Maria. Awesome. So I think that wraps up our needs assessment summary. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you, everybody, for all your really great questions and comments. Like we mentioned, you know, this is a lot and we understand it's a lot to, to digest. So tomorrow um, you will be getting the full summary, the full report. Um, and then in two weeks, we'll have an opportunity to circle back and dig deep. All right. So next we're gonna take a 10 minute break. And during this 10 minute break, um, we're gonna be, after this 10 minute break, we're gonna be transitioning to talk about the fund expenditure plan. All right, so right now it's 2.55 and we're gonna come back at 3.05. All right, so see you in 10 minutes.
Thank you.
All right. So if you um, stepped away from your computer, I want to invite you to come back to your computer. We're now going to be transitioning to the next part of our meeting, which is going to be discussing um, the fund expenditure plan. So next, I'm going to pass the mic to Jasmine Mahaka, who's going to lead us through this portion. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jasmine Oaxaca, Supervising Engineer over the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Section in the Division of Financial Assistance. Today, I'll be talking briefly about the Fund Expenditure Plan priorities, and more on this will come in Part B of our first advisory group meeting in a couple weeks. Next slide, please. So these are our existing funding priorities as adopted by the State Water Board in the fiscal year 2020-21 fund expenditure plan. At this time, we anticipate these priorities will remain the same for the new fiscal year 2021-22 plan. The priorities are to address emergency or urgent funding needs where other emergency funds are not available and a critical water shortage or outage could occur. To address community water systems and school water systems out of compliance with primary drinking water standards with a focus on small disadvantaged communities or DACs. To accelerate consolidations for systems that are out of compliance, at-risk systems, as well as state small water systems or state smalls, and domestic wells with a focus again on small DACs, and to provide interim solutions, initiate planning efforts for long-term solutions, and fund capital projects for state smalls and domestic wells with source water above a primary maximum contaminant level or MCL. Next, please. These are our existing target allocations for the fiscal year 2020-21, $130 million uh, allocated for the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. At Part B of this advisory group meeting in a few weeks, we will be providing an update on where we have committed funds for this fiscal year and also discuss where we plan to allocate funds for this coming fiscal year 2021-22 based on the results of the needs assessment as well as your input. Next, please. And this is our timeline for the fiscal year 2021-22 fund expenditure plan. Again, this is an annual plan that gets adopted every year. Some important dates as far as public participation are the planned release of the draft for public comments in early June with discussion at another advisory group meeting on June 10th and board workshop on June 16th. The public comment period will be for 30 days and then we will propose the plan for the board consideration for adoption at the August 17th board meeting. So that's all I had for today, um, and I can take questions if there are any. So once again, if you want to ask Jasmine any clarifying questions or any comments, go onto the bottom of your screen, click reactions, raise hand. All right. If we don't have any questions for Jasmine, we'll have an opportunity to ask her anything that comes up. And again, the reason we wanted to present the fund expenditure plan is now that we understand the, the drinking water needs of the state, we want to also begin thinking about um, 
what what updates or changes we want to you all want to suggest as an advisory group for the next fund expenditure plan. So we'll we'll circle back on April twenty second. Thank you so much, Jasmine. All right. So we're going to go ahead and move into our public comment process. So I'm going to pass the mic now to Jessica, who's going to walk us through that process um, and explain how, um, how we're going to facilitate that. Thanks, Adriana. So um, we're going to open up the meeting to our public comment now. Um, this is an opportunity for members of the public to provide comments on items that have been listed on today's agenda. So water board staff and advisory group members will not be providing responses to these comments. Um, but if you have comments or questions that require a response, we do ask that you contact um, the SAFER staff via email at safer at waterboards.ca.gov or leave a voicemail at 916-445-5615 and we will get back to you. So you can submit your comments if you haven't already via email to safer at waterboards.ca.gov. Um, we will give you the option to join the Zoom meeting um, or you can provide your comment, uh, sorry, where you can provide your comment live or you can have a waterboard staff person read your comment for you. So the public comments that you provide today will be included in our meeting notes. We will post those meeting notes on our website and provide them to the state water board members within three weeks of today's meeting. So again, um, the session is limited to public comments regarding items on today's safer advisory group meeting agenda. Um, it looks like we have about 30 minutes to get through um, any public comments that we have. So let me see if we have received any comments. So maybe I'll ask um, Ted or Itzel, have we received any comments? Not yet, not at this time. Okay, our webcast is a little behind, so we're going to give a little bit of time to see if anyone has any responses and emails us. Um, and then we'll see what we would need to move on at that point. So this is a little unusual for us to not have any public comments. So I think we're all, all a little surprised <laughs> about that. Um, but Adriana, I wonder, do you want to um, open it up to any other questions from the advisory group members at this point, since we do have some extra time? And if we have some public comments coming in, we can always jump back in to do that. Yeah, that's a great idea, Jessica. Do any advisory group members have any general comments that they'd like to share, questions, or just any general reflections that are coming up to you, coming up for you as we um, discuss the needs assessment or the fund expenditure plan? Go for it, Isabel. Okay, uh, una de mis Más bien es preocupación eh, que quisiera que hubiera, uh, siguiéramos trabajando a soluciones eh, como en comunidades eh, rurales. Me refiero a mi comunidad. Eh, ahorita teníamos las nuevas norias, pero ha, sal ha salido otro contaminante en la NARE. Ha salido otro contaminante que se llama benzín. 
Entonces, eh, me preocupa a largo plazo los problemas porque vamos solucionando algo y nos está resultando algo más. Eh, quisiera soluciones a conexiones, a anexión con sistemas más grandes que se acelerara a eso porque muchas de las veces eh, otros sistemas no quieren, no están de acuerdo en esas conexiones y necesitamos que, que el mismo gobierno nos apoye a lograrlo porque esto se acaba de descubrir que tiene el benzín, entonces uh, salemos de una y vamos a otra y aún estamos sobreviviendo con la pandemia. Really great question, Isabel. Viviana, before you interpret, can I just give folks one more reminder to please select either English or Spanish so that you can um, hear the translation of Isabel's comment? Yes, one of my main worries is, or rather what I would prefer is if we could keep working on solutions for the rural communities. Um, my community, is, there's another containment issue and, and that is in the community of Linares. And the issue is with benzene in the water. Um, I'm worried because it seems like we solve one problem before we jump into another. I would like to see solutions regarding consolida consolidation with bigger systems. Sometimes the bigger areas do not want to go into consolidation. And um, I believe that we need government assistance for this to solve these matters. Like I said, we jump from one problem and into another. Thank you so much for your comment, Isabel. I'm wondering if Michelle wants to speak a little bit about consolidations and then maybe if someone from DFA would like to speak a little bit about um, incentives for consolidations. Yeah, Adriana, I'd be happy to. I'd also be happy to talk to Isabel afterwards to talk about the specifics. Um, one of the things that comes to my mind is uh, if it's benzene is another contaminant that we're working on, we also might want to include, oops, I just realized my video turned off instead of on. Um, we also may want to include the regional board because that is a man-made contaminant. So we should be looking at sort of all of our options, but in terms of consolidation, I definitely um, would like to hear more about specifically what your community is facing and, and have a discussion about that because we do have authority for uh, disadvantaged communities where there is a contaminant issue if um, if consolidation is feasible and we're finding a larger water system doesn't want doesn't want to voluntarily consolidate then we do have authority to do mandatory consolidation so um, I will touch bases with you after the meeting so thank you. Hi, Isabel. I just wanted to chime in um, as far as um, consolidation incentives. Um, so since consolidation acceleration is one of our priorities, we do offer um, some incentives for that, uh, for the typically for the larger system, taking on um, smaller system and depending on how many connections, there's you know, a certain dollar amount of project that they, the larger system would be eligible for grant funding for. Um, this could be you know, something to improve their infrastructure or some other type of project that they had in mind um, that we can help. But that's how we're incentivizing at the moment. Um, I think we're also offering 0% um, financing for a larger project. Um, and then our intended use plan for the drinking water state revolving fund uh, for this coming fiscal year will be adopted in June, I believe. And uh, that will outline, you know, this coming year's um, new incentives. 
for consolidation. Thanks so much, Michelle and, and Jasmine. Jessica, do we have any additional public comments or do you want us to move on to the next, next piece? We do not, I think we can move on, thank you. Awesome, great, well, thank you all so much. So next we're gonna be walking through um, next steps for our meeting. So um, like we mentioned, like we mentioned earlier in the meeting, the next steps from our conversation is you'll have a couple more opportunities to um, dig into the results of the needs assessment in the next coming days. Tomorrow, you're gonna to receive via email the full report, and you're also gonna receive information on how to join the needs assessment webinar that's taking place next Tuesday. If you wanna learn more about the details of the methodology that they use, the data, and how they came up with those numbers, how to interpret the report, that, that webinar on Tuesday is a really great opportunity. Between these next two weeks, we encourage you to take a look at that report, to talk to, to, talk to members of your community, to sort of compile your feedback. And when we come back on April 22nd, um, we're gonna be diving into discussion. Some of the discussion questions that we're going to be asking you are um, the following. We're gonna be asking questions such as, Based on the needs assessment, which type of system should be prioritized for safer funding in 2022 or 2021, 2022? Based on last year's fund expenditure plan, how should the funding categories be increased or decreased? So taking a look at the spreadsheet that, um, that Jasmine went over today, the Excel spreadsheet, which of those categories do you recommend um, shifting? And given the high level of need for capital infrastructure, how should the State Water Board prior prioritize operations and maintenance funding? So those are just some of the type of questions that we're gonna be discussing when we come back on April 22nd. Any questions on the purpose of our meeting on April 22nd and the, um, the different opportunities to learn more that, are, that will be coming up in the next couple of months? No? Awesome. All right, and the last thing we wanted to mention is our Safer Summer Series. So Horacio earlier today asked us a really great question about um, outreach to the public. Um, so the Safer Summer Series is an opportunity for all of you, as well as members of the public, to learn more about Safer. These are all of the different opportunities that um, folks are gonna have to learn more, not just about the needs assessment, but about the fund expenditure plan, as well as other topics uh, about other, other Safer topics. Um, in a few weeks, you'll also be receiving a flyer that has more information about this Safer Summer Series. Um, and we encourage you not only to participate, to join, but we, we might be asking you to help us um, actually during these meetings to either share a little bit about your community, how the Safer program has um, supported your safe drinking water efforts, or to talk a little bit more about your participation as part of the advisory group. So either if you're participating as a participant or as a co-presenter with us, we wanna thank you in advance for um, getting the word out to your community about the SAFER program so more folks can um, participate as part of this, this learning series. So to wrap up, we just wanna thank you so much for taking the time to join us and to participate today and for really helping guide us in the right direction. All of your questions and comments really make sure that um, the SAFER program is, is aligning with the needs of the community. We also wanna thank all State Water Board staff um, from the Division of Drinking Water, the Division of Financial Assistance, our Office of Chief Counsel, the Office of Public Participation, as well as board member Firestone and um, board chair Esquivel for joining us today and for all of the work that came um, before this meeting, leading up to this meeting. So it's time for us to wrap up our meeting and your favorite part of the meeting, our safer chat. So I'm gonna ask everybody to go ahead and unmute yourself.
for those of you who are new to the Safer Advisory Group meeting, we always like to end this meeting on a strong note. And the chant that we're gonna be repeating today is, water should be safe, water will be safe. And then we'll repeat it again in Spanish. El agua debería ser sana, el agua será sana. All right? So on three, we're all gonna do it together. So go ahead and unmute yourself. So one, two, three. Water should be safe. Water will be safe. Water will be safe. El agua debería ser sana. El agua debería ser segura. El agua será sana. El agua será sana. El agua será sana. Beautiful. Loved hearing the Zoom chorus. Thank you all so much. We will see you on April 22nd. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Gracias. Adios. 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 Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.